SJC 12054, Nancy Chadwick v. Duxbury Public Schools. Margolis, good morning. May it please the court, Jonathan J. Margolis for the plaintiff appellant Nancy Chadwick, and with me is Beth Myers. Knowledge is power, and management or the employer's knowledge of what a, an employee says to her union or the union to her provides the employer with power over that relationship between the union and the employee. Well, that may, that may be an unfair labor practice, depending on the context, but that hardly makes it a privileged conversation. Well, Your Honor, I would suggest, and, and I, I've got to admit that the amicus briefs submitted here by the various unions state it better than we could, because we're employment lawyers, not labor lawyers, but that it's a necessary implication from chapter uh, 150E that a privilege should apply. The way I would suggest it is, uh, and that's particularly the case here where there's an independent civil action uh, under a statute that provides complete relief to employees, that the employee should not be disadvantaged vis-a-vis -vis someone who is not a member of a union, <coughs> excuse me, or someone who chooses not to avail herself of the grievance process. And that's what would happen if there's no uh, privilege implied here. But, but you know, we've never implied a privilege and the sky has not fallen. There have actually been 40 plus years of public unions. No such privilege has been recognized. The world hasn't crumbled. I mean, so we're saying all of a sudden because of this case, it, it could happen. Well. The your Honor, the fact is that from all that I've been able to see, both in the Commonwealth since Chapter 150E was enacted and, in the, uh, and nationally, there has been very little litigation over the issue because it has been largely presumed that communications so between... Think, why do you think that's true? Yeah. It's been largely presumed. Because there are, for one thing, because there are so few cases involved. But that could go the other way, right? And the cases, the cases that have involved direct uh, attempts by management to obtain communications between the employer and the, uh, between the union and the employee have tended to find that there is protection for that. Well, it's usually because it's a part of the bargaining process. That's an unfair labor practice. It could be an unfair labor practice in many regards, but this is civil litigation. Right. Well, but then what you are saying, Your Honor, is that someone like Ms. Chadwick, who avails herself of the grievance process, or the plaintiff in Carr versus Transgas who went all the way through arbitration, is therefore disadvantaged versus those of our clients who do not have a union. Are, are, are any union representatives attorneys? Uh, some are. Uh, and and in, in, in the cases where an attorney representative is representing the union employee, would they be able to gain access to communications? Would, would, would the municipal municipality be able to gain access to communications between the union employee and the attorney representative? Um, I, do not, I do not believe so, but I will tell you. Would the attorney-client privilege apply? Yes, I believe it would in the same way that when an insurance company retains an attorney to represent someone in a personal injury action, that there is a privilege bet for communications between the attorney and the insurer, and also between the, insurer, the attorney and the insured. And I suggest that that analogy uh, is involved. I will tell you, when we talk about litigation, last week we received from a state agency notices of deposition of two lawyers for a union who represent one of our plaintiffs and represented him in an arbitration that took seven or eight years and was only concluded in the middle of the civil suit. So, so it's not as if you're moving from one 
chapter to another, past the grievance process to the litigation process. I'm, I'm sorry, sorry to interrupt you. Um, this case, to me, seems not to be so much about uh, protecting the union member's right vis-a-vis uh, -vis the employer in a labor setting. I mean, in this case, your client has put her communications at issue by bringing a lawsuit for uh, discrimination, right? So, I mean, I mean in, in that situation, uh, wouldn't you expect that the employer who is presumably uh, related in some way to the communications would, how, how can that be fair to the employer if the employee can say, well, everything that I said that s has to do with my case, I don't have to tell you about it because it relates to my communication uh, privilege with, with my union. I, there's just something wrong with that picture. Your Honor, when you say that, my answer to that is that the unfairness really runs toward the employee who then has to choose between which of her legal rights she can take. She has a legal right under Chapter 150E to avail herself of the union grievance and arbitration process. And I suggest that it's a good idea for employees to do that because the vast majority of cases are resolved there. Or she can go to the Commission Against Discrimination and then <coughs> file a lawsuit if that doesn't work out. But if she does both, then she is going to expose herself to, greater, to a greater range of discovery than the person who doesn't have a union or the person who says, no, I don't trust the grievance process because that's controlled by management. I'm going to go right to my private lawyer. Can I? Well, I don't think the comparison is fair between your client and a person who doesn't have a union. I mean, that's, that's not the right... Uh, comparison here. Uh, the, the person who doesn't have a union obviously doesn't have these concerns, but your, what, what you are proposing is, is this sort of unlimited privilege that would completely cut the employer off from anything uh, that has to do with communications with the union, that facts that may be entirely relevant and perhaps even dispositive in some respects to her claims. So how can, how can you say that the employer should have no access to any of that? What we're saying here, Your, Your Honor, is a limited privilege for communications between her and the union as her representative. The example which we gave in the briefing is the example was if a union steward sees a fight on the floor of the factory, the employer can call the steward in and say, okay, who hit who? What was said? What caused it? But, but is, is there a difference between um, uh, a situation where in, in some of the cases with, that have recognized the privilege, it, it has been in the context of there was a possibility or a likelihood of a disciplinary proceeding happening with respect to the employee who's asserting the privilege. Is there a difference between uh, an employee who's in that situation where there's a possibility of a disciplinary uh, proceeding against her and somebody who is affirmatively seeking to advance some other right? Um, I, if I would suggest that in, in terms, uh, in our terms, in terms of this case, no, um, and, but as was pointed out, it's an unfair labor practice to call a steward in and say, okay, we're gonna fire you if you don't do it. But that, because of its chilling effect. But the difference is that certain employees, those who are grieved under Chapter 151B or, or Section 111F of 141, they have a, a parallel right to redress in the courts or in the, in the commission and the courts for civil rights violations or violations. They, in a sense, have a greater right. They have the right to, to redress under 
the, through the union contract and, not or, but and, they have a right to redress through the, the justice system. Just uh, get clarity on something that I'm very confused about. I take it that you're saying it's an unfair labor practice and it's not the status quo uh, so that in the grievance and arbitration process, I take it that management could not get any access to employee communications with union representatives. Is that right? Um, they're not supposed to. Do they, you know, <laughs> yes. They're, they're not supposed, not to, supposed to get the unfair labor because practice? Because it's presumably an unfair labor practice. So this whole area is sort of supposedly walled off in the grievance and arbitration process? My understanding is that it is, and if you look at the cases, I believe it is. But there, you know, there have been attempts to do that. Cook Paint was one of them. And the defendants have suggested that Cook Paint should not really be applied. And that's the that's the Do we have any cases first. that have that, that do that in the I know Town of Hudson, but that's that was really about whether um, that was about somebody at, uh, uh, attending that, a meeting. But, but right. But in terms of actually walling off the communications in the in the grievance the and arbitration process? There is a case um, which we cited. It's the city of Quincy. It's a um, tw I think it's 27 mass labor cases um, in which it was said that it's a it it's was a said prohibited by practice. By, by a it, court it's or a, by, the, by, by the, the labor commission in which it was said that it's uh, it's a protected uh, practice for an individual to communicate with her union. But there has not been a case that's come up, and again, I suggest it's because before it has not been challenged, uh, in which the employer has, has really fought to get communications. Well, in cer that certainly in the arena of collective bargaining, it's a different story. In other words, trying to get the union strategy by deposing employees about their conversations. I mean, that's different. There are several different contexts here. One is the grievance procedure itself, and I, I don't know exactly how that sorts itself out in terms the, of whether the communications between employee and union might be part of that. The, the uh, bargaining uh, situation is, uh, the only case I know of is the Illinois Educational Labor Relations Board <coughs> case that we've cited, and that happens to have Although I don't know that it's directly in point here, it's, it's a, it has a very good discussion of the issues underlying the issues here in this case, the considerations as to why uh, a protection is necessary. Now, uh, you, you have, of course, an exercise, I think you're right under 26C to move to quash, correct? Well, we, we opposed a motion to, uh, to compel. Compel, okay. So, it's not a subpoena. Uh, so. Okay, so, but same standard. Yes. Uh, would it be a proper grounds to, uh, even if you do not have a privilege, would it be a proper grounds to quash to say that it would be an unfair labor practice for the party in this case to seek this information? I do not know, Your Honor. Would it matter? I mean, it would matter, I guess, in terms of if it was an individual seeking it, it would not be an unfair labor practice for the it individual to be doing it. It may be unfair labor practice for the employer to do it. Whether whether a superior court judge would would find that that would be sufficient grounds to uh, refuse a motion to compel, I don't know. It wasn't done in this case, but frankly, we didn't argue it. Can I ask you what is the scope of the privilege that you're seeking to have us recognize? I mean, it seems to me that the Amicus brief takes a broader view than yours, but I want to be clear about that because it would seem to me that, y you know, the amicus is suggesting that it would be not just as against the employer, but also against third parties. Uh, uh, that's my understanding, the position that the amici have taken. Um, it is our position that to decide this case, you need only decide whether there's a privilege against attempts by the employer to obtain the information. Uh, is that also true for private as opposed to public union? Well, private unions um, wouldn't certainly not be covered by the statute. And I, I will have to say that we're when we get into labor law concepts beyond the <laughs> bounds of this case, I'm getting really to the boundaries of my knowledge, and I don't really want to pontificate on that. So, so, so the, uh, I, I take it if, if the union representative we're on the factory floor and, and, and something, an incident flared up 
and he said, what happened? Who hit who? That would not be a privileged communication. No, but where it would get privileged would be, it, well, in Cook Paint, the steward was called in and said, what did Jones say to you? That's where, if, if the combatants talk to the steward about it. Now, of course, if the steward is a percipient witness and the combatants or one of them actually talks to the steward in the role of steward, it gets a little dicey, but these are the kind of informalities that the nature of labor relations uh, causes that would you know, give those of us who practice in the court system the willies, but it's Well, speaking it's of common. the willies, I mean, when you say union rep, how do you define union rep? Would it involve any union officer? It's someone who is acting on behalf of the employee with respect in the case of a grievance proceeding to the grievance so that in Ms. Chadwick's case, she was the president of her local union. Um, among those who acted as her emissaries, her representatives, were members of her board. When they were acting as her representatives in talking to the school administration, that would be privileged. If she was talking to them, it, or if they were percipient witnesses of other events, conversations that they had with school officials, that would be uh, not protected. If the individual who's seeking relief <coughs> is speaking to someone who is sometimes their representative but is not actively the representative, it gets into a area. In this case, we, we, there, we don't know any of the, we, we know that you've claimed that they're privileged, but we don't know the circumstances of whether somebody actually was acting we, we, we have not discussed that. I, I will suggest to you that I've looked at the communications and that it is my belief that they were all in a representative capacity. There may be situations in which there will be conversations between a, a union member and her representative that is not involved the representation. I, I meant to ask you in terms of the scope of the privilege, who would hold that privilege? The well, amicus takes the view that it would be the union who holds the privilege. What do you say? Reluctantly, I have been led to agree. My first reaction was no. I thought um, you thought both of them had it. The union's position is that the union owns the privilege, holds the privilege, but it may be invoked by the employee in the first instance. But because the union represents the entire group of employees, that the union could, in effect, withdraw it. That it, in the same way as a union can say, we're not going to take this dispute to arbitration. And I think, as a practical matter, that's really the way it has to be. Is the, can the union decide whether or not to agree, whether or not a, a matter can proceed through the grievance procedure or only to the final stage, to arbitration? In most contracts, it's my understanding, it's only the final stage of arbitration. There may be some contracts where the union can say, we're not going to take it to the third stage. But usually, to the first or second stage, it's really up to the employee. I'm sorry, is it your view that only the union can invoke it, or that the union or the employee? The, the employee, excuse me. But, can, so, but it, I take it, it, it seems to me to follow from that position that the union could waive it, and the employee would be stuck. The, the <laughs> union can waive it subject to a denial of fair representation. I don't like that, but I think given the, the overall nature of labor law, that's the way it has to be. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Mr. Clarity, good morning. May it please the court, John Clarity on behalf of the Duxbury Public Schools. Uh, we made, in defense of a employment discrimination case, made routine discovery requests seeking any communications or documents or statements made related to the incidents in this uh, lawsuit. Do you These agree that if if this were in the context of a grievance or an arbitration, that you would not be entitled to access these uh, communications with the union representatives? Uh, not exactly. It depends on the hypothetical. I'll, I'll agree that there is uh, potential for unfair labor practices if an employer seeks to pry into the discussions between the union member and the, uh, the employee during a grievance proceeding. But it depends on what is being asked for. Including an arbitration? Yes, I, yes. So, so let's just say rather than bringing a lawsuit under 151B, um, uh, Ms. Chadwick had claimed an 
you know, had grieved that she was not being accommodated uh, for the PTSD. And it was actually proceeding that way. Could you get it? Could you get the stuff? Any, well, any time, my understanding, again, like uh, my brother, I'm not a labor lawyer. I do employment uh, litigation. Uh, my understanding is that an employee is within its rights to do a preliminary investigation of the facts. And the employer. employee or plan, employer? Employer, I'm sorry. <coughs> within its rights. Could subpoena the, I mean, could, could require the union rep to say what it is that they talked about? Again, it's all fact dependent. That's not the case here. But certainly we have a right, and I think this court has recognized a right for an employer, especially a public employer, to ask uh, employees to disclose what circumstances, you know, as part of their uh, employment investigation. Well, okay. So, well, well let the, does, the, I'm wondering if the shoe fits the other foot here. Um, if, a, uh, if in the course of this lawsuit, the plaintiff's lawyer sought discovery about communications between town council uh, and a member of, 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 of the city or town, the superintendent of schools, uh, could 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 discovery be be had or required in those circumstances? Well, by town council, you mean the town's attorney? The town's attorney. Obviously not. There's an attorney. Well, so why privilege. should it be? Why should it? Uh, you you be able to get discovery going in one direction but not in the other? Well, two reasons. One, because there's a well-recognized attorney-client privilege that's been in existence since the early 1800s in this Commonwealth, as well as you know in England for for probably centuries before that. So attorney-client privilege is a different mode of protection for those particular communications. But this Commonwealth, by legislation, has recognized that the uh, collective bargaining of uh, the employer is not, as, uh, you know, is privileged pursuant to public records law. They don't, are not allowed to disclose that because it would affect the bargaining uh, protection. So there's already a legislative recognition of confidentiality as to those communications. This is collective bargaining. bargaining. This is a grievance. Well, uh, the question I thought was posed was why wouldn't we have to reveal those things? And it's because uh, there's a recognized confidentiality as to collective, collective bargaining uh, and discussions. And you're saying that this discussion of this particular grievance would, would fit within that? Uh, I'm just unclear on the hypothetical that's okay, being the posed. Hypothetical, the hypothetical I thought was um, she grieved it. She, she, she's grieving it as, you know, it's... it's um, uh, it's a violation of the collective bargaining agreement that her um, her PTSD isn't being uh, accommodated, and she, that's the grievance. And are you saying that the that a conversation between put, put the attorney <coughs> client, but the, the, a conversation that the superintendent has with a variety of other people would be would would be protected because of the collective bargaining? Oh, no, absolutely not, oh. Your Honor. Oh, uh, in, in that scenario, certainly in this case, if there are discussions between the principal and the assistant principal about the reasons for their finding her performance substandard, which is why we're, we're uh, disciplining her, which, you know, obviously is a case issue in this case, those would be open for discovery, I would think, in the grievance proceedings. What did the assistant principal say to the principal about his observations of her teaching performance, that type of thing. Certainly she would get that. And I think on the other hand, we'd be entitled to find out, uh, you know, if she made admissions or statements uh, that, uh, hey, you representatives? know. Representatives? To, un to union representatives? In the collective bargaining, uh, I mean, excuse me, in the grievance proceeding? Yes. No, not those communications. But if, she, if she's uh, stating, you know, yeah, that was a properly based Say she made a mission that, you know, I dropped the ball in that class, I didn't perform well in that class, I refused to grade the homework or something Saying like this that. To, who, she's made, who is she making this admission to? To, to any witnesses, fellow members of the union. There's been 27 witnesses identified in this okay, case. Okay, so anybody other than a union representative we're talking about? I think that the, you know, again, the, we're talking here about an employment discrimination case, not a collective bargaining case. So I think we're getting far afield. But in the, in the grievance proceedings, uh, if she went to a union rep to seek advice on how to uh, pursue her grievance or protect herself from any disciplinary action, then that, I think, would be beyond the pale for the employer to get. But if she's just going and speaking to perhaps her coworker is the union oh, steward. Oh, fair enough. But, but let's say she hasn't, let's say this is happening, um, she, she is talking to the union rep about whether to grieve it or not, and she's very upset, and it's, it's all about this, you know, this impending um, uh, meeting, uh, reviewing her performance, and she doesn't know whether she's going to grieve it, she doesn't know what she's going to do, but it's a conversation with the union rep. 
she later decides she's not going to grieve it, but she's going to bring a 151B action. Mm -hmm. Do you get it in that circumstance, but she wouldn't get it if she grieved it? Certainly. Is that what you're saying? Certainly. And I think actually, if you look at the case law, these types of discussions are, are written in all, in all the cases we cited in our brief. There's frequently case law talking about discussions between the union rep and uh, the employee about whether to take the grievance, when they took it, was it timely filed, did you fail and fail to represent claims? They're always talking about why didn't. You get that or you don't get that? Oh, the, the case law talks about what was discussed. I mean, it's funny that the Quincy School case was cited from the uh, Mass uh, uh, Labor Commission report decision, which I hadn't seen before I got the reply brief. In that case, she's, she uh, is uh, grieving a wrongful termination. And if you look at the facts, there's two, three pages of facts, and all they talk about is a discussion she had with her union rep about whether to take this grievance or not, because one of her claims was they retaliated against me so, for, so, for but, taking but, 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 but that, that, that now, now, now you've confused me. So let's imagine, let's take the example Justice Botsford mentioned, somebody who has, uh, who has PTSD and believes that she's not been reasonably accommodated, and she sits down with her union representative, and she says, listen, I think I want to consider grieving this matter, and I'm going to tell you everything that has happened, and then she grieves it. Would you, as the employer, during that grievance procedure, be able to get access to all that she said to the union rep? In, no, to the extent that she's talking to her for the purposes of whether to decide to grieve or and to pursue her grievance. Okay, and, 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 and you would not because you, the view was that it would be an unfair labor practice to do that. Uh, yeah, and I think the practice is, my understanding of the practice is, is that the, the employers typically don't do that for that risk. They don't want to expose themselves okay. to potential. Okay, so let's, let's play that out, and that same individual either grieves it or decides, I don't trust the grievance practice, and I'm going to actually bring this as a discrimination claim. Mm -hmm. uh, you're saying that when it is filed in court, that same conversation becomes fair game. Yes. And why is it, if it was an unfair labor practice <coughs> before, why is it not an unfair labor practice now? Because I'm not defending an unfair labor practice. I'm defending an employment discrimination case. But so you, we but, have a right. But, but, but you would not do it because you would think it to be an unfair labor practice, but you're doing the same thing, and now it's no longer an unfair labor practice. Or is it your view that an unfair labor practice is not a grounds to quash a subpoena, that an employer is permitted to engage in an unfair labor practice during the course of a court case. Well, I'm not suggesting it would be an unfair labor practice if during a court case, and I don't agree with but that. Well, you, but you said it would be during a grievance procedure. It would expose the employer to an unfair labor practice. Again, it all depends on the circumstances, but it, even presuming it does, that doesn't mean that by the plaintiff choosing to bring her claim in a court of law where the truth-seeking function takes priority over any confidences that she may have with her union uh, representative. There's a difference between confidentiality and respecting confidentiality and establishing an evidentiary privilege. So, so is, it, is, is, the, is it because she was not represented by an attorney in the course of the grievance procedure, um, but is represented by an attorney now, or is it because somehow the relationship between the employee and her uh, union representative uh, really is, it's sort of, it's almost an institutional relationship the same way there's an institutional relationship between the superintendent of schools and the deputy superintendent. It, I, I think I understand your question. Yes, it's because it's an institutional relationship why we respect the confidentiality, but just because we're respecting confidentiality in a grievance proceeding doesn't mean it's an evidentiary privilege in a later... The, uh, do you think in, in, in the scenario, if, if, if we accept your view, okay, she's got this lawsuit, you get all these conversations. Would that would it then be fair game for the school department to somehow and, and let's say she hadn't retired, I mean she so she's still employed. Would it be would it be fair game for the school department then to use the information that it got in defending that lawsuit somehow uh, against her with respect to some labor issue at school? Like a disciplinary yeah. to well, discipline her. Well so Yes and no, I guess, depending on what the, what the scenario is. But the, uh, the ad issue here is her complaints about her performance reviews and that type of thing. We're not asking for, in discovery in the civil case, 
stuff that went on, you know, that could be used later against the union. I don't see how. Oh, I mean, I don't know. What, you know, well, you I mean, know. the document requests are fairly specific concerning plaintiff's performance evaluations or performance reviews, communications with respect to that. Yes, and that's because she's alleging those performance reviews, Your Honor, were the retaliatory conduct of my, my clients. So she put her performance reviews in issue by bringing this lawsuit saying that I've been discriminated against and this is the form of discrimination, these bad performance reviews. But what if, I mean, for example, just hypothetically, let's say that part of that conversation, I mean, this is, is she says to the union rep, you know, they gave me a bad review about class on April 5th. The fact is I was drunk. Could the, could the school department then use that and say, you, you know, you were drunk while you were teaching, that's a fireable offense? If she filed a civil suit and that came to light in a civil suit, yeah. certainly. Just like, you know, it, it, you look at the Broderick case where uh, this court was asked to decide whether um, a, a, a employee could be terminated for refusing to cooperate in a police investigation of the police misconduct. And they said, we're not going to talk to you about that. And this court said, yes, you can terminate or discharge an employee if, you, if they refuse to cooperate to narrowly drawn answer narrowly drawn questions about their, their job performance within their scope of employment. So, I mean, there's obviously Fifth Amendment issues that arise and the, and the U.S. Supreme Court has spoken to that, but setting that aside, uh, certainly uh, this court's already recognized that an employer can take disciplinary steps that were, uh, about the union, uh, assertion of a union client, uh, union, union member privilege. <coughs> can an employee move to quash and say, Your Honor, Regardless of whether there's a privilege, it would be an unfair labor, it's an unfair labor practice for the employer to seek this information. And that is a grounds to quash the subpoena. I would say no. I would say no for a couple of reasons. One, they've chosen their form. There's always a consequence of choosing your form where you want to bring your action. So I disagree with my brother on, you know, they're treated differently because they're trying to pursue a claim with under 151B. And secondly, uh, there's a standing issue. Uh, who, who would have the standing to bring an unfair labor practices claim, uh, the union or the employee, uh, if you're, you know, if you're uh, asserting that that's what, they're, what, what is at stake here. One of the, the problems with uh, this case and what, this, what the plaintiff is asking to do in this case is that even the union amicus and, and the plaintiff itself can't agree on who holds a privilege or the scope of the privilege. So I think there's a real danger here in opening up the door to having unions to seek to intervene in, in lawsuits like this assert a privilege, veto any, uh, you know, waiver of purported privilege by the, by the plaintiff. There was, for example, the California case where one of the employees wanted his union representative to talk about other discriminatory statements made by other employees that he gained in the role of his union representation. Does this, does so, this put in, the, the, this conversation that we've been having, does, it, does the, the result put a, uh, uh, an improper chilling effect on the employee's right to file a civil action? I mean, why would anybody want to file a civil action if they'd made certain representations to a union representative um, that are now discoverable uh, if in, in, in a civil proceeding? Well, because they're seeking money damages. So certainly they have their own personal motive in bringing a, a personal money damages claim against their employer, which would obtain relief that they couldn't get through the grievance proceeding. and. If they really want to protect their communications, they could always speak to a union attorney, which we're not saying would ever be something that they'd be subject to discovery in a case such as this. But that's so impractical, don't you think? I mean, an employee is going to have the right to say, I don't want to talk to the rep. I want to talk to the attorney because I don't want what I have to say to be later disclosed. That, as a practical matter, that's not possible, is it? <coughs> uh, well, I won't concede it's not possible. I think frequently union attorneys get involved in cases even at the grievance stage. And in fact, the town of Hudson case, was, which this court decided involved a union attorney appeals coming court, to sit in. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry, appeals court. Union attorney came to sit in as the union representative at a Weingarten uh, meeting. And so this court addressed whether well, that constitutes an, a, a, a a right of an employee to have a union attorney there. All right, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We'll, we'll take our morning break. Thank you.